Anduin Lane Rin, born a prince and heir to the throne of Stormwind, from a long and illustrious line descended from the first days of the Arathor Kingdom. But he was born with the weight of responsibility for all his people, a weight that often becomes too much to bear. Born to the valiant King Varian Rin and the loving Tiffin, during a time of peace, after the scars of the Second War had begun to fade. He would favour his mother in looks, inheriting her golden locks and earning himself the nickname the Boy of Sunshine. But while born into peace, this did not last long. Tragedy first struck at an early age when he unfortunately lost his mother to a stray rock, one thrown by a rioting mason over a disagreement in payment. The very people his mother was advocating for at the time. She was unwaveringly kind, a trait she hoped to instill in her son. The third war would follow, the events of which he would mostly be spared from. He was ten years old once the war ended, and his father had been called to peace talks between Stormwind and the New Horde, led by the war chief Thrall and spurred on by the Lady Jaina Proudmoore. Their recent cooperation during the war had laid the foundations of peace, and Anduin would encourage his hesitant father to pursue it. But Varian would disappear en route to the Theramor Isle, leaving the throne empty, under the urging of Lady Katrana Presta. At only ten years of age, Anduin would have the crown thrust upon him. He did the best he could with the help of his advisers like the acting regent High Lord Bolvar Fordragon, who commanded the king's forces in his name. This would continue for some time, with Anduin impressing many for his skills at such a tender age. But as mysteriously as his father had disappeared, one day he just returned, to much fanfare as the city celebrated the return of their beloved king. But all was not right, and Anduin could feel it, his father was not the same man that had left. The Defias Brotherhood, a group of thieves and blackguards formed from the Masons who fled the city years prior, were blamed for kidnapping and the subsequent ransoming of Varian. But Anduin sensed something was amiss. Many others also began to comment on the strange behaviour of the king and his sudden lack of honour. This all came to a head when a second Varian rushed the gates of Stormwind. This confusing event would reveal Katrana by her true name, Anixia, daughter of Deathwing and a black dragon masquerading among them. Revealing her true terrible form, a great battle broke out. Amidst the commotion, Anixia's true plans were revealed. She grabbed the young Prince Anduin and teleported him to her lair daring Varian to come and claim him. Despite being under the guard of Draconids, Anduin managed to free himself for a time, evading recapture until the Snacks of Stormwind and his father could reach him. But the assault on the lair would not go smoothly. Many lives were lost, and in the end, Onyxia threatened to kill Anduin should they not surrender. But the prince urged his father not to give in, an intense battle ensued, and the great black worm hurled a devastating spell at Varian, but the spell went awry. Both Varians were caught within its deadly grasp, and instead of harming them, it made the two halves whole. Varian would go on to impale the dragon and drag its head back to Stormwind. They returned as valiant heroes. With a newfound bond with his father, Anduin refocused on his studies once more. He had a lot to live up to. But he was interrupted when the Scourge invasion began. Nowhere was safe from the reach of the Lich King, it seems, and he was forced to take up arms in defence of Stormwind from the Scourge soldiers. Despite claiming victory in this battle, they knew this was not the end. Bolvar Fordragon, whom Anduin had become so close with, was chosen to lead the armies of Stormwind and Northrend, as they began a great campaign to stop the Lich King once and for all. 
Many believed that if they could claim victory here, there would at last be peace. But this victory came at a terrible cost. Bolvar's death hit Anduin hard, coming at a time when he was still figuring himself out. Despite his training, he was not showing the aptitude for martial combat, and his pursuit of peace often drove him into conflict with his father, who was driven more by impulse. The prince was sent as a diplomat to Ironforge, where Varian had hoped he would be hardened by the martial prowess of the dwarves, just as he was when he was a boy. But Anduin instead found his true calling. The dwarves' fervent faith in the light is inspiring, and Anduin begins his journey as a priest. His compassion would be an asset as a priest, rather than a failing. But a series of violent earthquakes had devastated the dwarves, even losing one of his friends to them, Aaron. He had helped Anduin discover his passion for swordsmanship. It was the memory of his late friend that caused the prince to continue this training. However, now he would do it with the light always by his side. King Magni Bronzebeard had a plan to stop these quakes, and he invited Anduin, among others, to be part of a small council that would put a stop to them. Deep down below Ironforge, in a small cavern, Magni would invoke the ancient magic of the earthen. He would petrify himself in order to become one with the mountain. This was real sacrifice for his people, Anduin thought. But the sudden vacuum of power invited civil war into Ironforge, and Anduin was forced to escape to his Aunt Jaina in Theramore. It was here an unlikely friendship was born. Bane Bloodhoof by happenstance was also in Theramore at the time, also being the son of a great tree, thrust into a position of leadership far too young. Despite being from different worlds, they shared common ground. Their discussion proved insightful to both helping each other discover the path they should take forward. Anduin would give his friend a mighty gift, the Mace, Fearbreaker, and promise they would stay in touch through their letters. Anduin once again found himself making peace where others would see enemies. Troubling news had reached his ears. His father was leading SI-7 elite operatives in a mission to end the occupation of Ironforge from Moira, Anduin did not feel this was right. Instead, he implored his aunt to portal him directly to the city. He arrived just in time. He explained that killing Moira would instead create more instability. Instead, they should forge a path forward together, so one day the Dwarven clans may once again unite under a single rule. The Council of Three Hammers was forged, a decision that caused much celebration from all of the citizenry of Ironforge. And most importantly, his father finally saw his son grow into his own. But Anduin was still on another journey. He loved his father, but ultimately, his overprotective nature was holding him back. It was then that he met the Prophet Balin, wise leader of the Draenei and devoted priest of the Light. He resolved to follow Valen so that he may study the ways of a priest, a decision that his father resented. But as much as the prophet mentored the burgeoning young student, he himself learned lessons from the prince. His compassion was infectious to all around. Valen had forgotten the troubles of today in order to prepare for the future. He saw in Anduin a powerful future priest and a wise future king. As time passed, Anduin would also find himself spending much time with the Naru Oros within the Exodar, learning all he could of the light. As the years passed, his strength would steadily grow, now far more sure of himself and who he wanted to be. When he would return to Stormwind, even his father began to respect the path he had chosen. The bad blood between them would fade over time but his resolve would soon be tested when Garrosh used the mana bomb on Theramore. 
the Alliance fought back against the tyranny of Garrosh. He had to hold firm to his belief in peace, even when his Aunt Jaina, who was once one of the greatest advocates for peace, became consumed by vengeance. Ultimately, Anduin would still believe in the path. Later, in pursuit of this very goal, Anduin was on a diplomatic mission when his ship was attacked by a horde vessel. Eventually, both ships would run aground on an island covered in a thick mist. This discovery would turn out to be momentous, as they had found the long lost land of Pandaria. Something had guided Anduin here, and he began a journey that would change him forever. He travelled these ancient lands, befriending the native peoples and evading capture by the Horde forces that had arrived alongside him. He took the opportunity to visit the Temple of the August Celestials, powerful wild gods sworn to the safeguard the lands of Pandaria from an ancient evil. His long journey would culminate in the Vale of Eternal Blossoms. He saw firsthand the darkness that lingered just below the surface of this bountiful land. The conflict between the Horde and the Alliance had spread poison. They had awoken the Shah, dark spirits of the old god Yasharaj that fed on negative emotion. He counselled the Alliance and his father on the dangers they posed. When an artifact was discovered that could wield this darkness, he convinced many that using it was far too dangerous. They risked destroying the very people they were trying to save. The Horde, under Garrosh's rule, did not agree. He saw potential for the Horde to win a decisive victory by any means necessary. Anduin would try and stop him, but he was badly wounded in an unprovoked attack by the Orc Warchief. This would be a pivotal turning point, souring any further peace talks between the two factions. This deeply hurt Anduin, who had always wished for nothing more than peace. Despite his grievous wounds, Anduin had become a man of purpose, and more than a little stubborn, just like his father. He insisted on being allowed to speak and learn with the peoples of Pandaria. His short journey led him to the Tavern in the Mists. There he met the Black Dragon, Rathian. The two would spend long days together, discussing politics, philosophy and morality. Despite not being able to shake the feeling that he could not trust Rathian, he could not help but be intrigued by him. However, other events demanded greater attention. The Warchief Garrosh had not only severed ties with the Alliance, but also fractured the Horde itself. Anduin was in attendance the day Ogrimmar was besieged, and Garrosh ultimately fell. When his trial began, Anduin reached out to Rathian, inviting him to attend, with which he graciously agreed to. During the proceedings, he was called forth as a witness, but in usual Anduin fashion, he made it clear he sought no revenge on Garrosh, and believed he could change, which made what happened next even more devastating. Garrosh had made an ally in Kairos, a crazed bronze dragon, in order to rewrite history and the future of Azeroth. The former warchief had escaped, but worse for all, they were aided by none other than Rathian, a betrayal that hit Anduin hard. He would go on to spend the next few years recovering from his wounds. That is, until a terrible event occurred. The return of the Burning Legion. This threat was so beyond anything the world had ever seen. To survive, old hatreds would have to be buried. Only a unified front had any hope of surviving now. The Horde and the Alliance joined forces and attacked the invading demons at the Battle of the Broken Shore. But the combined forces of Azeroth were utterly defeated, and Varian, among many others, were lost in the battle. The time had finally come. He would have to wear the crown and lead his people to victory. All his life had been preparing him for this moment, and he doubted if he was ready. 
but he knew he had no choice. The nagging doubt continued to plague Anduin. He had lost faith in himself and believed others to feel the same. It was only in journeying to the broken shore himself, to the place where his father had fallen, that he could heal. In the ash scattered on the ground, he found his father's sword Charlemagne and had a vision. In this vision of his father, he asked him what he should do. In that answer, he knew he had no other choice but to do what was right. He was ready to become the king his people needed. He would lead his people in the same manner he always had, in pursuit of peace, and his first real opportunity was about to present itself. He was visiting the Netherlite temple in order to treat with the conclave priesthood, and it amazed him to see how there were all races working together as one, under the leadership of a forsaken, Alonso's Fowl, a man Anduin still had great respect for. He seized the opportunity to open negotiations with the Forsaken and maybe heal the rift. Surprisingly, Sylvanus was open to the idea and a time and date was set for the families of the Alliance and Forsaken to meet and reconcile, with tight security on both sides. At first, it appeared all was going to plan. It would take time but peace was possible. Sylvanus, halfway through, decided to withdraw and ordered the Forsaken to follow. Some, however, disobeyed and wished to stay. Those that remained were ruthlessly attacked by her guards. Anduin had been outmaneuvered. The Banshee Queen would use this as a rallying cry to blame the attack on the Alliance and forgo any hope of peace. He knew in that moment that peace could not be possible as long as Sylvanus was in power. This proved all too true. Sylvanus, now leader of the Horde, had escalated the conflict between the two factions to all new levels, culminating in the burning of the Night Elves home, the World Tree Teldrassil, an event which shook the very earth to its core. Many including Anduin, could not believe the depths the Horde had sunk to. The young lion led the Alliance War campaign to ultimately put a stop to Sylvanus and her Horde, leading him outside the gates of Ogrimmar, eerily reminiscent of a time not too long ago, in which they besieged another corrupt war chief. This time, Sourfang managed to spare the city that fate baiting Sylvanus into tipping her hand and revealing her true motivations. But her dark machinations soon bore fruit. Anduin was among a few others that were captured by strange winged creatures of death. They had taken him to a prison in which none would ever leave, to endure the tormented realm of the Maw, a dark place for damned souls. The very best of the Alliance forces would venture into the Shadowlands to save their leaders. Eventually, with the help of the Ebon Blade, they breached the Maw and mounted a rescue of Anduin, Bane, Thrall and Jaina. They came close, but the ruler of this dark realm, Solval the Drailer, would quickly recapture them and take them to Torghast, his personal tower of torment. Sylvanus, working in the Jailer's name, would visit him often, attempting to sway Anduin to her cause. But she repeatedly failed and would have to resort to more forceful measures. They reforged his sword Charlemagne into a mourn blade, fueled by the soul of what remained of Arthas Menethil. This allowed the Jailer to suppress his will and puppeteer the king to achieve his own ends. Any attempts to struggle were in vain as the darkness of this ancient being swallowed him, allowing him to watch as he committed unspeakable acts. But the champions of Azeroth would not relent, and at the last moment, they helped save his soul. Despite being physically free from domination, and the Jailer utterly destroyed, 
Anduin is not the same man he was before, nor will he be the same king. He never returned to the throne, instead choosing exile, fearful of that one dark part of him. But now Azeroth calls for its heroes once more, and he needs to face those fears. Anduin's character has come a long way, but it is far too easy to forget that his life, more than most on Azeroth, has been a series of trials and tragedies. And in my humble opinion, the community has always been more than a little unfair to him. He lost his mother before he could really know her. His father was absent for a huge portion of his development, and then he lost him before he had a real chance to get to know him. He was born into bondage. He was never given a choice, and yet, time and again, he chose peace and compassion. Of course, we all love those characters with amazing battle prowess. Masters of the sword, of magic, or the knife. But none of them have been as strong as Anduin. None of them have been able to consistently make the right choice, each and every time, even if it hurts to do so. This is why it's so jarring, yet understandable, to see him now. Sovol gave him his first taste of darkness, and for the first time in Anduin's life, he could let go. For the first time, he was free from his burdens. Imagine you were in his shoes, enjoying that freedom, even knowing the terrible price would distress any of us. But his next steps on his journey will be crucial. Will he be able to overcome his trauma? Will he heal and renew his faith? Or will he be too scarred to go on? Is he broken now? Or is this just too much? And should we let him rest after all he's been through? Perhaps his path lies somewhere in between. I am sure a lot of us can relate. Having expectations of who you should be, with who you want to be, and sometimes we all crumble a little under that pressure. I really want to know where everyone else believes Anduin's story will end up. How about you tell us in the comments, or come tell us on the Discord, the link's in the description. And if you could drop a like and subscribe, it really does help the algorithm. And hopefully I'll see you all in the next episode, where we cover the story of Illyria so far. Oh, and don't forget to come back anytime. Thank you.